Following the release of The Giant Behemoth, director Eugene Lurie began work on a follow-up monster movie, again to be set in modern-day London, only this time it would be filmed in stunning Technicolor. Produced by the King Brothers, who had success distributing Rodan in the United States, the film was made with the cooperation of the United States, the United Kingdom, and Ireland, and drew heavy inspiration from Godzilla and other Japanese kaiju films, even going so far as to use the art of suitmation for the special effects sequences as opposed to stop-motion animation. Simply titled Gorgo, the film was released in 1961, and would go on to become one of the most recognizable and iconic western giant monster movies for its clever twists and explosive colorful action. While salvaging for treasure off the coast of Ireland, Captain Joe Ryan and First Officer Sam Slade witness a violent volcanic eruption that almost sinks their ship. As they await repairs on the nearby Nara Island, they encounter a large underwater creature, who later that night rises from the ocean and attacks the island. Seeing an opportunity, Joe and Sam offer to capture the creature, an endeavor that proves successful, after which they ship it to London to be put on display for the world to see. However, scientists discover that the creature, dubbed Gorgo, is actually an infant, and that the mother is probably still out there, none too happy that her baby has been taken away from her. In many ways, Gorgo is an amalgamation of a decade's worth of ideas drawn from previous monster movies. Like Eugene Lurie's previous two giant monster films, it features a giant dinosaur-like creature who rises from the ocean to destroy iconic landmarks. Like King Kong, it intentionally draws sympathy from the viewer by having the monster be a victim of human greed that ultimately ends up being their undoing. And like Godzilla, the monster is presented as an indestructible symbol of nature that puts humanity in its place. This is to say that the film, at least from a storytelling perspective, perspective isn't really anything special or unique if you are at all familiar with the genre. However, thanks to solid presentation, impressive special effects, and a sympathetic monster, the film stands as a last hurrah in a time when giant monster movies, at least in the West, were beginning to fade in popularity. What makes Gorgo stand out the most is the twist that the creature we've been seeing through most of the film is actually just a baby. The reveal of the full-grown Godzilla-sized Gorgo remains one of the genre's most compelling plot developments, both in terms of sheer shock value and for the way in which it endears the audience to the monster. Much like the Japanese films that inspired it, we are meant to sympathize with Gorgo, not just condemn it, which is very unlike most Western monster movies at the time. This effect is aided by the creature design, which, with its glowing red eyes and menacingly huge claws, strikes a good balance between being generic and distinct. Also like its Japanese counterparts, suitmation and model work are used to bring the creature and its destruction to life. And while it has its obvious limitations, it's pretty well done, resulting in some fantastic imagery that simply wouldn't have been possible with stop motion. The human cast of Gorgo is pretty much what you expect from a giant monster movie from this era, sufficient enough to move the plot along and nothing more. The story is mostly told from the perspective of Captain Joe Ryan, played by Bill Travers, and his first officer Sam Slade, played by William Sylvester. As far as leads go, they are pretty bland, because neither brings much to the characters to make them distinct. If anything, the most memorable character is Sean, the little village boy who tags along with them out of sympathy he feels for Gorgo. His role in the story is very similar to the kids in the Showa-era Gamera films, which it predates by a few years, leading to wonder if the folks at Dai might have took some inspiration from here. Along with the human cast being unremarkable, Gorgo also suffers from some technical deficiencies. Some of them, of course, can't be helped for the time, but others, such as the heavy reliance on blue screen, even in basic dialogue scenes, draws attention to itself in ways that date the film. The film also has some pretty choppy editing at times, with some shots lasting so short you barely have time to register what you're looking at. This makes some of the destruction sequences geographically hard to follow, and thus takes away a bit from their impact. These issues, while relatively minor, give the film a distinct lack of polish that may dampen your viewing experience depending on how much they bother you.
Overall, Gorgo is a solid monster movie that excels in a lot of areas but falls short in certain others. Its high point is everything having to do with the monster. Its design and execution are inspired, as is the reveal of the mother Gorgo, which remains one of the genre's great twists, culminating in some fantastic sequences of destruction that are sure to satisfy your thirst for mayhem. However, everything else is merely okay. The story is a mishmash of things you've seen before. The characters, what little there are, are serviceable at best, and the awkward choppy editing can get distracting at times. Even with these flaws though, it's got enough old school thrills to satisfy most kaiju enthusiasts, and so is definitely worth seeing. For more reviews and opinions on all things kaiju, subscribe and stay tuned to Up From The Depths.